Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's, a, it's my honor and privilege to introduce Professor Emmanuel Hasleit, who is serving as a uh, professor of uh, humanities at Graduate School of uh, Pan Pacific and International Studies. He also uh, is a director of uh, Asian Institute, a uh, think tank. Uh, he played many important roles, such as uh, consultant and, and advisor to public and government organizations, including Chu uh, Chong Nam and mayor of the uh, city of Gwangju and city of Daejeon, as well as uh, CEO of uh, uh, the uh, yeah. Daejeon uh, Research for uh, Cluster uh, Institute. Uh, he also taught at the Georgetown University and also served as uh, an advisor to Korean ambassador to uh, Washington. He also spoke before uh, last year and uh, he published uh, many books including uh, the story of uh, Park ji -won, the story of a Korean tributary mission to China. So today he's going to speak on the uh, uh, it's a different topic, the uh, scars of the world discuss Korea's future, and also uh, there is a uh, books from the Asia Institute, which is a selected publication which may be included uh, in his presentation. So it's available. At uh, discount the price of nine thousand won, you can uh, pick up uh, when you go out. Okay, so without further ado, let's welcome Professor Pat Wright with a big round of applause. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here uh, once again. Can oh, you want to record it, or you want it to be it on? Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, all right. I'm going to the back here again. You, you can't hear so well in the back. Now, but it's better. All right, thank you. So, uh, I've been very honored to be here. Uh, I uh, originally had a great affinity with the Royal Asiatic Society. I not only taught, talked here before, spoken here before, uh, but I have also a background in classical studies and did basically 17th, 18th century uh, Korean and Japanese intellectual history. Uh, previously, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, a book that I published recently, the English version of all the uh, uh, interviews and seminars are uh, available here. Uh, and I also want to say just a word about... different formats. So, we have an Asian Institute, which has been around now here for five years, and we've tried to bring together a variety of different people to discuss uh, contemporary issues uh, in Asia, uh, and we will have, we have more events coming up, and I hope uh, if you're interested, you'll take a look uh, either at our website uh, or at our Facebook uh, uh, site. We also are going to have on the 27th an event on uh, uh, environment, education and environment uh, here in Seoul. Okay. So in this particular case, uh, I was approached, I've done a series of interviews with important uh, figures uh, for a Chunan, uh, Chunan, uh, uh, Chunan, the, 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 the uh, monthly Chunan, uh, and I was asked uh, by a publisher, Hassan Books, uh, to uh, make it into a book. Of course, they didn't actually take my material to make them into a book, but they asked me to do even more interviews. Uh, and so we started on this process, this uh, odyssey of trying to ask people uh, what they thought about contemporary issues uh, in Korea. So it was in part what I was asked to do, but it was in part also my interest. And I think for this event, of having such a distinguished group of individuals that I try and keep my presentation per se uh, uh, short and have a chance to talk about 
these critical issues in Korea with everybody here uh, present. So, one of the motivations for the book was, of course, the question of what we foreigners are doing here in Korea. Uh, and that is, of course, uh, a role which is changing very quickly. That the Royal Asiatic Society, for example, was one sort of foreigner in Korea. Uh, but as Korea faced with the uh, twin challenges of an aging society uh, and also low birth rate, uh, foreigners are increasingly here, I find, uh, increasingly sophisticated and complex international communities. So the question of our role in society in Korea is an increasingly important one. Uh, I was also inspired to do the interviews and the seminars and write the book uh, by the narrowness of discussion of political issues uh, in Korea. Often issues, whether they're about the, the politics or economic issues or what's called populism, tend to see it in terms of what happens in Korea specifically, and not so much in terms of how it's a continuum of issues that are being faced uh, around the world. As an American, this is particularly striking to me because many of the problems that Koreans perceive in their own society are, of course, at least as serious in American society, uh, but Koreans tend to think of America as, I don't know, uh, Disneyland is maybe not the right word for it, but this sort of unchanging paradise, uh, which it really is not. And so we have this challenge of trying to reconcile uh, this Korean-centered vision of social issues, or economic issues, and then their, the way in which they, they are actually continuous uh, with problems around the world. Uh, and then uh, another extremely serious problem we have in Korea Korea is now becoming an incredibly important economic, uh, political, uh, diplomatic, uh, and technological power in the world. Uh, but the dialogue between intellectuals uh, in Korea and their peers overseas is still extremely limited. The number of, say, contemporary intellectuals uh, who are known outside of Korea is very limited. And of course, if you read something like The Wall Street, New York Times, uh, to see an article written by a major Korean professor uh, is, uh, I think, extremely rare, if ever. Uh, so there's a real need for a sort of engagement with both here in Korea and also with famous people overseas, important scholars overseas, not necessarily famous, uh, to engage them on the question of what's actually happening in Korea. Uh, and Korea is changing very rapidly, is increasingly important in the world. This is the final motivation. So that what happens in Korea, it used to be something just for Korea, right? So how Koreans live their lives, what they eat, how they, whether they watch TV or go to movies, what sort of cars they drive, it's really only about Korea for Koreans, and the only issue was exporting cars or uh, television sets or uh, uh, semiconductors. But today, what Koreans do influences the entire world very profoundly. Uh, many young people uh, in, in Indonesia or in Uzbekistan, uh, you're deciding how to live your life based upon images of life that you see, or uh, of the good life that you see from Korea. So how Koreans live, what they do, is no longer an issue just for Koreans today. Um, so this is the book uh, as it came out uh, in uh, Korean. Uh, and uh, we tried, uh, talk, the election is already over, so I don't talk about that anymore. Uh, but the, uh, we tried to interview on a variety of different issues. Social, like basically everything that came up in the election uh, as a topic, and try and get a sort of outside view. Now, I'm not going to try and summarize everything. So I just took like a little quote from each individual. Uh, who I spoke with, uh, and I don't even know if I want to try and read them all out. I'll try and just summarize the, the, the import, and then I hope we can launch into a sort of discussion about these topics and our own perspectives as individuals who probably know a lot more about them than famous scholars outside uh, around the world who uh, have, a, we have to explain it to them first. So that, that was actually the process just to give you a bit of the behind the scenes is uh, if I talked to, say, Francis Fukuyama, I, I couldn't 
merely expect him to understand who Anchosu or Papine is, uh, but I had to actually explain this is what it is, this is what the issue is. Is this analogous um, to something that you're familiar with? And then we could have a sort of discussion. So, in fact, Korea has not that level uh, of recognition around the world. It, it, it should, uh, but it has not. And it's actually quite sad, uh, in my opinion, as someone who I taught Asian studies in the United States for uh, 10, as a professor for about 10 years. Uh, and I was constantly frustrated by the fact that so much of the great Korean tradition is not translated at all, or translated poorly, or not available. So most Americans just do not grow up, uh, do not go to school with any sense of what Korea is in a so with, in, with any depth. They may have heard of Kim Jong-il or maybe Kim Jong-un now. Not so much because many scholarly texts have been published about him, but rather that he's been able to get on the headlines recently. Um, so, let's progress. So, uh, Benjamin Barber, uh, in fact, I interviewed him about the issue of populism, very, very uh, widely disputed and discussed in Korea at the time, has a very specific meaning in Korea, with this sort of appealing to the general voters uh, with some particular uh, slogan, uh, the most famous of which was the uh, free lunch uh, for uh, uh, schools, for public schools. Um, and uh, Benjamin Barber, by the way, as a result of this series of, of discussions, we went on, we both spoke and then we emailed for, I guess, a month or so about the topic, uh, took a great interest in Seoul, and in fact he came to Seoul, and met with Mayor Park, uh, and had a series of dialogues with him about his ideas about the uh, Parliament of Mayors. So, uh, I don't know if it was entirely me, uh, but I, I played a role in getting him very interested in Korea, and I think that potential is very much there. So, uh, we talked a little bit about uh, uh, um, An Cho Su and about the uh, issue of being a citizen. Uh, he spoke at great length about the question about uh, the citizen and sort of commercialization, the way in which things are increasingly uh, becoming uh, products, and we talked about that quite a bit in terms of the sense in which uh, politics itself has become so. so Maybe I'll just read a little bit uh, um, about it. So the commercialization of all things is the most dangerous manipulation of all. The spread of such per perceptions eludes individuals into thinking that as private consumers they can do what a responsible public citizen would do. They cannot. In order to understand the difference between consumers and citizens, civic education needs to focus on the distinction between private and pu public good, between private liberty and public liberty. And this he was, I think, specifically talking about this discussion about uh, the uh, free meals. So the discussion which took place, uh, and in some ways still goes on, is whether uh, schools should offer uh, meals. And we talked a lot about the question about what is the public good and what is the role uh, of government uh, therein. He also talked quite a bit about education, uh, and specifically we discussed uh, the question, as you'll find in the book, uh, about uh, Korean education and, uh, and, and its uh, relative strengths. I have another section actually in this book on the question of Korean education specifically, so I'll go on to that in a second. Um, uh, we then uh, talked with uh, Clyde Prestowitz. He was probably best known uh, for his book, uh, Trading Places. Uh, he worked on the Japanese economics and trade and was a chief negotiator for the Reagan administration a long time ago uh, on the question of trade. So we asked him about trade, which of course has been an enormous issue in Korea, the question of what free trade is and what its function is. Uh, actually, I have him paired. Most of the chapters in the Korean book are pairings between two individuals. Uh, the person that he's paired with, however, a uh, Honda Hiropini, I have only Japanese and the Korean translation, so I'm, I'm sorry I don't have an English version of it, so I'll just 
briefly mention about the uh, Clyde Pentius. So this was the one thing he, he, he mentioned in terms of trying to describe what he described as sort of a, his uh, explanation of, of what he uh, termed as the Asian approach to the question of economics. Uh, and he specifically talked about the Japanese pre-war Japanese economic policy, which had a was profound uh, impact on how uh, uh, Korea has also pursued economic policy. And the specific uh, phrase here, finance minister of Japan, Takahashi Kure uh, Kyo, uh, and he said, the consequences of economic defeat are far more difficult to reverse than those of a military defeat. And this was what Prestowitz uh, suggested that the essence in the difference between, say, American and uh, Asian or Korean perceptions of trade and economic relations was that often trade issues are seen as even more critical than what, say, American. You'll forgive me for giving a sort of American century view. I, I had, I happen to have been born in that country and I got most of my education there, so I tend to think in those uh, terms. Uh, and, of course, Clyde Prestowitz is from the United States, and I knew him from, from the United States. So the American perspective being that there are these sort of security concerns and that they trump uh, economic or trade issues uh, on occasion. Uh, and the sort of the Japanese, in some degree, Korean perspective, as he presented it, which was that the economic issues actually trump security issues. And in the long term, particular military setbacks are not as serious as economic issues. Uh, uh, and then also talking about the question of uh, reciprocity uh, in, uh, in trade. So talking about Asia, they know that if they want to export, they sometimes have to buy something in return, but they don't really want to buy things. So they enter the market opening agreements in which they agree to open their markets in return for overseas market access. But typically, the Asian country's market does not open very much, even after the agreement is implemented. I would say, by the way, that when the publisher, when I gave them the section, the Clyde Prestowitz uh, chapter, uh, it was the one they liked the least. <laughs> <laughs> he seemed to be the most American, the most critical, uh, well, I'll put it this way, critical in the way the Koreans don't really like. <laughs> other people, I mean, they're all critical, but uh, somehow this particular perspective uh, was not uh, so popular. Uh, but I think it's a, it's a very representative of the perspectives on Korea that you will find in the United States. And of course, Clyde Prestwitz himself is known for being extremely critical of uh, uh, free trade from an American perspective. But of course, the Korean perspective is quite different again. Uh, and then uh, Harold Barmas, uh, who's the head of the National Cancer Institute uh, and is advisor to the Obama administration now for science, I think maybe he's no longer, he was last term. Uh, uh, and uh, he talked a little bit about Korea's role in science and technology. These, I'm warning you, these are very, very diverse set of topics that we interviewed about. That was, in a way, the entire point. Uh, so this is as opposed to last lecture you had, which was on North Korea, this is all over the place. Uh, so he talked a little bit about what Korea's role should be. And I think this is a very, very important topic for us to think about what Korea can do uh, globally. To come back to our theme of Korea's global role, I think the science diplomacy is one of where Korea scientists can play a central role, especially in Asia. Uh, we are in the midst of setting up a new center for global health in the National Cancer Institute. As a part of that effort, we're building our own network with partners in Asia, Central and South America and Africa, so we can promote better approaches to cancer research. Korea is starting to play a role in overall. Korea is well positioned with trained scientists and a strong scientific base to play an important role in promoting international collaboration and breaking down barriers between nations. In fact, promoting the understanding of science in North Korea could be an excellent way to find common ground. Uh, in fact, this is Korea is increasingly playing this role. Uh, we don't always see it in, in the newspapers, uh, but in terms of science and technology, 
uh, around the world. There's an increasing number of young scientists who are trained in Korea. And Korea, uh, as you may know, is now a standard for people from countries all over the world to come to learn about how to run research institutes, how to conduct research, and what some of the best practices are. Uh, there's a whole generation of new scientists, places like Indonesia, Vietnam, uh, who have their training uh, from Korea. Uh, and in some ways, the influence, I think, is greater than the United States in places like Southeast Asia. Uh, okay. Guess we slow. Okay, so then on the question of media. So, Noam Chomsky and, and uh, Bob McChesney are probably the two best known uh, critics of U.S. media. Uh, and we had a long discussion with both of them uh, on I did, uh, on the question of the Korean media. Now, I will tell you first that although Korean media is incredibly important in, throughout Asia and the world now, uh, that neither of them really had <coughs> any idea of what was happening in Korean media. So I had to sort of, I don't want to say Students feed it. <laughs> but I had to like say, you know, these are the issues in Korean media, this is what happened, and then say, well, does that sound like anything vaguely interesting to you? Uh, uh, in the case of uh, Noam Chomsky, uh, I think he was very, um, actually both of them were particularly impressed of the question of uh, the labor movement in the media. So, as you know, under the email back administration, at uh, places like uh, YTN uh, and NBC, there was a, uh, they had uh, new presidents appointed uh, by the Ingenbach uh, administration, and there was enormous resistance to this uh, attempt to put, in, the case, in some of these cases, like uh, to put organizations which have a government ties to place people who are essentially political figures as the head. In the case, for example, of YTN, there were extensive strikes, uh, and the strikes were, although slightly motivated by issues of pay, they were really about process and procedure. So uh, he was very impressed by that fact, uh, and talked a lot about uh, how inspiring Korea uh, could be uh, for people in the United States. And I, I have seen this elsewhere as well. People, of course, I would, you would probably characterize Noam Chomsky as being sort of a left in American politics. Uh, but it was interesting the degree to which, uh, in the discussion with him, uh, there seemed to be a real interest, uh, and even a sense of sort of, I wouldn't go as far as say envy, but a certain uh, inspiration to be drawn from what he saw here uh, in Korea. Uh, on the other side, so in the case of, uh, I'm a selfish prick. I know maybe it's not the best translation. Not a glimpse of that. It's a, a very famous uh, uh, show, which I think is sort of faded into oblivion recently, uh, but was uh, about a year or half ago, was extremely popular. Uh, and we talked uh, at length. I talked with him at length, and he's written on the question of what's called fake news. So we compared the case of uh, not in going to that, I'm a selfish prick, uh, with the other show, which is the Daily Show, uh, which is similar, right? It's a sort of a, a mock TV broadcast. They're not identical, because uh, not in going to that, only in part is it fake news, and in part it's sort of a variety show and humorous conversation. Um, but he made some very important points about it, uh, particularly, uh, he said that it was very valuable in the sense that it was pointing out certain ironies or problems within the society, within the political system. Uh, but he stressed that it was not journalism, right? That it's comedy. So you find some particular point and you make some insightful comment. Uh, but that what makes journalism work, and, and McChesney went on to this, about this for some time, is that you have to do an investigative journalism which requires money and effort. And so to just make sort of off-the-cuff remarks, as true as they may be, without the backing of actual investigative journalism, is not really journalism. And I think that's a very a legitimate point. He also, uh, in the case of McChesney, has felt very strongly that there's a real need to fund 
uh, uh, investigative journalism. And that in his case, he, he argues, in fact, that government should go ahead and actually finance that. Uh, media has suffered enormously. He, in the second part, he also expressed great interest in the, the strikes at the NBC, at KBS, and YTN, uh, and the efforts of journalists to try and uh, fight for a more open uh, a media environment. Uh, so then Francis Fukuyama uh, is uh, probably one of the best, uh, most popular uh, uh, political scientists in the United States. Uh, and uh, we asked him a little bit about the question of the outsider in Korean politics. Uh, specifically, of course, at this time. You have to understand these interviews were last year when An Chosu was the candidate or potential candidate originally. Uh, but we talked not just about An Chosu, about uh, Park Hong Su, our uh, current mayor, and also about Nomi Helen and his rise uh, as well. Uh, so he said uh, uh, quite a bit about this sort of the, the status of the outsider in politics. Uh, he made a sort of analogy between Schwarzenegger, Arnold Schwarzenegger, who was, of course, uh, uh, governor of California, and talking about how he was unable uh, to completely translate uh, his outsider status uh, into something uh, in terms of substantial long-term uh, implementation of these policies. Uh, and he faced the same problems and was ultimately, although maybe more famous uh, as a politician, equally ineffective in his efforts to implement uh, his policies. Uh, in this context, uh, Fukuyama talks about uh, people like uh, Theodore Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt and uh, Ronald, uh, Ronald Reagan talking about what their attempts were and how they were more successful in terms of building a larger sort of uh, uh, an image of the direction and not becoming overly involved in specific policy. He also talks at great length uh, in the discussion about the role of parties, taking the position that although everybody hates political parties, in fact, they are absolutely essential. That you cannot, uh, it's not that they just serve a, pro a, a function, but that they're absolutely necessary. You have to have some sort of a unit which doesn't just represent a specific interest group, but is able to sort of make these um, trade-offs, negotiations necessary to actually be successful in making policy, in making the policy. Uh, although Korea obviously is much more able than say the United States to do things outside of, of parties. There have many more people, including our mayor, who is, does not have a party per se. And it certainly, although it didn't happen, it certainly is possible for someone to become president uh, in Korea who is, does not have a, a party. Um, and then social welfare. So this is, again, based on hope to your social welfare was one of the major issues uh, in the election. And we had an extensive uh, the discussion about this, we picked uh, Sylvia Algaretto, who had, I actually had worked a little bit with in Washington, D.C., uh, and then uh, uh, Eric Schroeder, who was a professor in Germany, someone who I actually did not know uh, before this interview. Uh, he was recommended to us to sort of give a German perspective. So we tried to look a little bit at the issue uh, in Korea. Uh, so, Sylvia, uh, from uh, the uh, American perspective, um, the, the, the question, this, this is, um, one can look at the welfare problem in terms of the degree to which institution systems laws are not keeping up with the true situation in our society. As the impression of problems similar to the United States and Korea, we have an aging population and far fewer children in certain communities. The difference is, in the U.S., we have a large number of immigrants who pick up the slack. So although there's aging certain uh, population groups, overall, we've been able to go forward. This is, I think, a very, very important point. Uh, Korea, probably one of the greatest uh, issues in Korea today, is an extremely rapidly aging population. I think it's now uh, the top in terms of the rate at which the population is uh, aging. I think Singapore uh, and, uh, and uh, Korea. Uh, and so, however, if you look at it from an American worm's eye view of the world, uh, in fact, uh, Korea and the United States are in some ways quite similar. That's to say, Americans 
say, like myself, if you took a, as a separate tribe, which I think we probably are, uh, and you saw our demographics, you would see that we're aging at at least the same rate uh, as Korea. The only difference is the United States has enormous amount of immigration, which has allowed it to maintain a certain degree of diversity, demographic diversity. Uh, and then, looking from the uh, German perspective, um, uh, Schroeder, uh, Schroeder spoke at length about the question of, say, real estate, the way in which in, in uh, Germany uh, that owner occupation and use of real estate is a much smaller part. It's not really considered to be the essence of one's sort of one's retirement uh, or one's uh, uh, stability in society, and that, and that this uh, uh, makes for a very different. Uh, social welfare uh, structure. Uh, show shared ownership and collaboration, cooperatives, much more common in the, in the uh, German case than is case in, say, uh, Korea or in the United States, uh, and that this has made a lot more stability. Actually, he said a lot more than this, but I'm just giving you a little piece uh, of his statement. He did a very sort of interesting comparison between uh, Korea and Germany, uh, which I thought uh, was extremely helpful because you don't usually get that. Normally, you're comparing Korea with the United States, or even more commonly, comparing Korea with some non-existent uh, advanced country. Uh, the Sunjin group. Uh, maybe you're familiar with this term. But there's a term, Sunjin group, which means advanced countries. And often in political or social discourse in the media, there's Korea compared with the Sunjin group, which is this, I don't know, it's up there in the cloud. Uh, I've never seen a Sanji book myself, <laughs> uh, and so it, it's a it's a very sort of a common way for Koreans to uh, motivate them. I think it comes as sort of a way to motivate people in a political and economic sense to say we're still you know down here, but in these Sanji books, right? Then we you know everything is run really well, and we produce things very efficiently, and we have the most advanced technology. Um, okay, and then education, uh, English and American. In the case of Regina Murphy, of course, not a career expert uh, at all, uh, but she talked a lot about the question, uh, let's see the second half here. I received a distinct impression that Koreans were not interested in music and arts education. I was struck by the remarkable uniformity of clothing in Korea. And then that the crushing uniformity seemed to be a challenge in Korea, although I don't know Korea so well. And that's very much a part of education. I have, of course, two children who have been, uh, are still in, uh, my daughter's still in regular Korean elementary school, and my son has been twice in regular Korean elementary school and twice in the alternative English language school. Uh, but this issue of con uh, uh, conformity was one that she highlighted uh, uh, in, in her uh, discussion. Uh, and then Michael Seth, who you may know, is actually an expert on Korean education, the history of Korean education, and he spoke uh, at great length about the question of the historical background. And I thought this was, uh, I'm going to read a little bit of it just because I think it's quite helpful and the print is very small. Uh, I have an advantage. So under Japanese rule, higher education was reserved for the elites. Originally, there was a six-year primary school, and the middle school students were sorted out. So there used to be tracking only up to a very early age, and then essentially your life was set to work in a factory or work in a farm, uh, or if you were to go on to a higher education. Uh, everyone had a clear vocational track by the age of 12 under the system. 90% of children could see their options very limited by that age, and no perspective, no prospect other than attending vocational school. The experience in the colonial period had a precedent for determining social status based on education. So that's part one of the system. Um, but ironically, when the tracking system was eliminated, then every stage of the education process offered opportunities to move to the higher level of status for any student, and the entire school system became competitive at all levels. So it becomes, in a way, more open, but the idea that education itself is tied to status uh, remain uh, in uh, place. Uh, the result was fierce competition to get into good middle schools, good high schools, good universities. 
After World War II, there was a breakdown in the old hierarchy of Korean society, mm -hmm. greater fluidity in Korean society, which many Koreans took advantage of. In that fluidity and chaos, they found ways to get their children into better schools. Um, the educational system the government adopted in the 1940s, so basically became much more progressive, uh, but over time, of course, it has gone uh, in the other direction. He also, uh, Michael Seth, spoke uh, in, in quite in some detail about how what we tend to think of as the authoritarian, pre-democratic, or uh, not particularly democratic period today with Park Chung-hee and Chun Du Hwan uh, was in terms of education, in fact, more egalitarian by far than what you got later with, say, Kim Dae-jung and Mo Min-hun or afterward. That the, uh, the previous governments have been much more willing to push through uh, a sort of uniformity and egality in education uh, between uh, across the entire country in a way that later uh, stopped uh, or slowed down considerably. Uh, and then North Korea. So I know you spoke about North Korea next time, and I'm not going to try uh, and uh, uh, talk about it too much. Uh, I interviewed two people who have a considerable amount of expertise on this. Uh, Larry, uh, Lawrence, Larry Wilkerson. Lawrence Wilkerson uh, is probably best known as the chief of staff uh, under Colin Powell uh, in the uh, first term of the Bush administration, uh, and John Huntsman, who ran for uh, 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 president in the Republican primaries, uh, should have won, but of course completely ignored. Uh, and both of them extremely thoughtful individuals who've been very engaged with Asia over a long period of time. So in the case uh, of Larry Wilkerson, the first thing he's, his, you might find his chapter particularly interesting because he's very lively and totally unafraid and extremely critical, uh, but he was very critical obviously of the sort of general arrogance of Americans, and I have seen this firsthand. Uh, and the problems that have come, uh, Hillary Clinton, obviously a close friend of his, is a little better than peddling that arrogance, but overall the Americans are, no, are not accessible or accommodated to the problems that Koreans face on the ground. As I say, this trouble of Americans actually even comprehending of the sort of issues that actually exist in Korea. And the second problem is the inability of Americans to see big pictures. And this part, I think, the, the first part is maybe more personal. The second part, I think, is more objective. Uh, the, the question of how the United States has a lot more trouble in getting total pictures of, say, what the larger security diplomatic issues <laughs> are in, say, the Middle East uh, or East Asia as a whole. And if anything, likes to divide it up, to say, we're looking at Korea, we're looking at Japan, uh, and not look at the continuity uh, between them. Lacking a vision for what could be beyond our perceived self-interest. And that, I think, stands in contrast with the immediate post-war period where America was actually quite good at articulating a sort of larger vision. Um, and then with Huntsman, uh, he talked, this is of course long before, this is over a year ago, a year ago we talked about, but he spoke considerably about how these various uh, issues were, were related to Kim Jong-un's necessity to reinforce his own political legitimacy, which I think is totally right, uh, and his sense that you had, you could not expect any sort of breakthrough per, per se, that there are these longer term cycles uh, in terms of what happens politically within North Korea, and if you don't match up with those cycles, that there really is no hope for a breakthrough. That this, these activities are not so much drawn, although they may be related to some action by the United States or by South Korea, but that they're, but the larger force has to do with these long-term uh, uh, legitimation uh, and political transition issues within the country. So I think that's it. So I will stop here, uh, and I hope that we can maybe um, uh, have a discussion or about the uh, large range of issues that were brought up uh, by the people uh, that uh, I had the chance to speak with. Anybody? Comments or questions?
Scotland, 
uh, and got some perspectives from the Indian perspective on North-South relations. Uh, and her name I cannot recall now. Uh, uh, and uh, she said, made a very interesting analogy between Pakistan and India, North and South Korea. Uh, the publisher said, no way to <laughs> We're not going to print this <laughs> in your book. <clears throat> uh, the, the analogy was just too far-fetched and too irrelevant. Uh, and I, I, we've also, for example, the issue of, say, comparing Korea's relationship with Japan to, say, Poland's re relationship with Germany. That, although it's a very legitimate, especially if you go back to the next class, four or five hundred years, entirely legitimate uh, uh, comparison. It's not one that Koreans really are that interested uh, in discussing. Um, in this particular case, something like, say, the outsider in politics, uh, or the issue of, say, so, uh, populism, what that means, or what social welfare is, uh, I find, I read Korean newspaper every day, uh, and I find there is extremely limited use of terms the very specific Korean uh, example is a is like a small range of meanings to these terms. So it's extremely uh, missing uh, in political dis discourse. Now there are of course scholars who make all sorts of comparisons, but in terms of the day-to-day -day discussion about political issues, comparisons like with what happens in say Japan or the United States in the advanced country mode to say we should be more advanced, right? Germany does it better, so we should do better. These you get. But in terms of sort of like the diversity or complexity of the issue, or the universality of issues, say, like social welfare, uh, or education competition, uh, there it, you get it occasionally, but I think it's, it's really missing. And it's a serious problem for Korea, because many Koreans find it hard to sort of find empathy uh, with other countries, and even more serious, when they introduced Korea to other people, and I've done this sort of work, as others here uh, have done as well, uh, to try to introduce Korea to, uh, when Koreans try to introduce Korea to other people in other countries, it's often very hard to do because they have so much, Koreans have so much trouble in creating some sort of empathetic relationship to say, I'll go on about it. But it's a very uh, serious intellectual issue. <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, big fan of your work. But please, criticism, hmm? or, or just like a, well, well, how do you respond to this? It's like, hmm? uh, it seems to me, and you, talk, you use the word spoon fed, which is what you had to do. You went to these, these awesome academic right, straight spoon lines. Yes, I'm sorry. I, and then, it's but, but fair enough, like mm. you said, Chomsky didn't know mm. much about what you were talking mm. about. Right. So, I mean, you've got a limited amount of time to expose them to like these huge right. problems that would actually right. require, you know, how much time do you put into studying, or do we put into studying, and we live these, these <laughs> problems. And, like, and yes. then you go in and you, you spoon fed them for like, what, an hour, two right. hours, right. before you get their response? Right. That seems almost like a... Right. I'll fall in the premise of right. what you're doing. Right. Sorry. So that's an entirely legitimate criticism, and I gave, I have given this talk once before at my university, and I heard that from more than one person. Uh, so I would only, the only defense I have is to say that it's a first step to get this sort of interaction. That, that I think it was worth it to get someone like, say, Chomsky or Fubiyama to talk about Korea, because normally they don't talk about Korea at all. Zero. So it's, it's at least, you know, going from zero to one. Uh, and that, that's an infinite increase, right? From zero to one. Um, but I think it's a very, very serious issue, and it comes back for those... I, I'm a professor, so of course I taught Asian studies in the United States, and one of the biggest problems I found was, say, Korea, that's directly related to this is that although Korea spends, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars on developing semiconductors or panel displays, it invests very, very little money in actually, say, funding positions for people to teach Korean studies uh, in places like the United States or Germany 
uh, or France or elsewhere. And these positions are not that expensive. They cost like, I mean, I can't afford it, but it probably cost, you know, like $4 million to endow a chair. And, and if you don't endow chairs, then you don't train students and you don't get undergraduates who major in Korean studies and you don't get experts in the media, in government, and other places who know about Korea. So I, it's partially my fault, and I guess it's partially Chomsky and Fukuyama's fault for not knowing more about Korea, but it's actually, it's a long-term issue of actually serious commitment to introducing Korea around the world. Does that sound okay? That's entirely possible. Okay. <laughs> Please. Yeah, kind of a two-part question concerning media. Uh, one about Chomsky at his full speed, whatever, prep him. Don't be I'm not trying to say that. Yeah, I'm not worried about the social media stuff. You had to prep him, right? But um, it seemed to me that uh, he had a very kind of um, romanticized notion of the Korean media uh, because they had initial yeah. hurdles to come over. That's right. Did you discuss the, the recent media history with him at all? Um, so I think he, he to, to, to respond honestly, I think he latched onto the parts of the discussion that interested him, uh, and he interpreted them in his, his own way. Um, I don't agree with Chomsky on his analysis of media myself. I mean, he does have a certain certain issues that he's extremely knowledgeable about, but there are, it's, it's, the story is always more complicated than that, I mean, how media has evolved uh, and changed. Uh, I think that we should do it again. <laughs> I mean, I really, but let me put it this way. There's no book in, that I know of in English which gives a sort of a, a very in-depth discussion of Korean media and how it's evolved, right? Certainly not today. And I, in a way, it's ridiculous because Korean media has so much impact in the world today. There are so many people in like Indonesia or China or Vietnam who are sometimes taking Korean media as their primary source for media information. So if Korea has that much impact, how can it be that we have nothing, you know, on like Korean media? In Korean media history, we actually actually have to go back to the 1930s, right? It was, it, it, it's a great book. I, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, it's a nice book. What are you writing? I'm more about the media here. I'm just grooming myself. Please. <laughs> but, um, uh, the second guy was Robert McChesney. Right. right. Um, and I like the fact that he mentioned MVC uh, specifically. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. I don't, they've come under fire quite a couple of times in the last couple of years. Do you think? Have you seen any signs that there's a change? That they're aware that there's more international focus, more awareness of what they're putting out, and that maybe they, they have to do more real journalism, where they can off the cuff statements without backing it up. I mean, have you seen any progress on that front? So I'm going to have to again speak very frankly. Uh, when my son, who's in fifth grade, started to get glued to the TV about a year and a half ago, uh, TV disappeared from our house. <laughs> so I don't actually watch Korean, I, I sometimes watch this sort of tashipogi you know, on, on the internet, I'll watch like KBS uh, occasionally, but I have not kept up recently on what Korean media looks like uh, overall. But I, I can make some generalizations, I mean I, I don't know about specific changes, but I'll make some generalizations. Uh, it's a very interesting contrast with the U.S. Uh, in terms of what's, what's available. Uh, and Korean media, in some ways, it, sometimes it seems a little bit more superficial. Uh, on the other hand, it often gives a lot of news about things like infrastructure, you know, buildings built, uh, so sort of how things are administered on a day-to-day -day basis, which American media does not give you. So uh, for some, it's boring, it's less entertaining. But in fact, it actually is a better representation of like what's actually taking place in the country. So I, 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 I'm not particularly negative about the Korean media. And there's many. Uh, but in terms of our friend, Bob McChesney, I would say, again, zero to one, he had really no interest in Korean media. And now he's told me several times he's actually like to come to Korea. So we at least got the first step. One last question. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the discussion. Okay, sorry about 
Uh, in today's current uh, regional economic situation, we seem to have a good example of uh, macroeconomic concerns trumping uh, traditional, I guess, geopolitical uh, mm -hmm. standpoints, relationships. I think the Chicago debt value situation right. more mm -hmm. cost-effective, but right. um, I guess could you comment more on the pressures on Korea currently from maybe, obviously, you have Japanese you know, monetary policy and uh, Chinese industrial expansion. Right. Um, so how does this go for the future of, I guess, Korean in industry and the next board? <laughs> or the economy and next country? Right. So uh, not only am I unqualified, but I don't know if anybody is <laughs> qualified to answer that particular question. Uh, it, it has a lot to do with questions about you know, what's going to happen to currencies in general. I mean, you have the, so I'm, I'm talking off the cuff, so there's no qualification. But essentially, you have a situation in economics that makes no sense, right? So, for example, the price of gold drops, even though you have this massive inflationary printing of, of the currency in the United States and in Japan. So, we really don't know what's going on. Uh, and uh, uh, what's going to happen over time? Um, I, I personally think it has to do with uh, uh, technology, that in fact the, sh the, the shift from analog to digital system, in which money is essentially a digital form and is a form of extension of information exchange, means that a lot of the, the rules for economics and currency are like just different, unwritten. We're in sort of uncharted territory, uh, but I would love to know. Just seem to be sort of like a. You might have an insight. Advice, maybe. Well, maybe, maybe you, you're, you're in <laughs> All right. Well, we can continue to discuss this uh, later. So. Uh,